So we're looking at the aesthetic moment, and uh, we've looked so far at the objective uh, element in the in the aesthetic moment, and yesterday the subjective element in the uh, aesthetic moment. What I've called the the known and the knower. Now we need to look a little bit at the the knowing, which is in some ways the most interesting and most difficult to talk about. But let's uh, approach it by an experience that's probably familiar to you in your own terms, in your own experience. The, The point at which, when you're engaged with any kind of aesthetic object, you turn on to it, to use a 60s term. Uh, you find yourself engaged with it. It can be very striking, that, that uh, shift. Uh, and it must be equivalent, in a way, to uh, um, you know, passing over the threshold in meditation into jhana. And I think a lot of what I'm talking about, we're talking about, obviously, is uh, uh, the same as, as, as happens in meditation. I think that, that uh, the relationship to art and to meditation is very, very close. So uh, I remember a very striking experience of my own in this regard. Not that it was particularly exalted or anything like that, but it was the, the unexpectedness and the, 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 the starkness of it that really struck me. I'd been invited to Singapore to the opening of uh, uh, the Buddhist library. And, uh, well, you can imagine... They paid my fare to go to Singapore. They um, treated us, David Mitra and I, like royalty. Uh, they really treated us so well, so careful, so attentive. I've never eaten so much uh, Chinese food, but of the most exquisite kind. And all of it, um, what they call temple vegetarian, so that it's, it looks like meat, it tastes like meat, but it's not meat. Uh, not meat as we know it. Um, but, uh, you know, they kept us pretty occupied with uh, seeing various sites of, of Singapore, which is a rather strange place in many ways, a fascinating place. But uh, they, uh, that one afternoon they sent us off to the uh, National Art Museum. And uh, like many sort of collect- many collections of that kind... It's um, sort of a, 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 an assembly of minor works by everybody. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't really engage. For a start, it was just so strange looking at all this Western art, mainly Western art, or Western art done by um, Singaporeans, uh, in the middle of this strange uh, city, uh, which is very unique city-state. And... Uh, so I was, I, was, I was doing it because it was on the program kind of thing and cursorily looking at this and looking at that. And uh, we went into a room of, of uh, French Impressionists, as I say, minor works by everybody. And I came in front of um, a painting by Pissarro. It was a painting of um, a, a Normandy harbour and in a way I don't know whether it was much of a painting uh, to this day but suddenly the painting just grabbed me as I described uh, the, way, the way in which a work does it sort of pulled me into it and I found myself in a completely different state of mind state of consciousness unawares, startled I hadn't been trying I don't think it was a great piece of art. It was a pretty good piece of art. But suddenly I found myself uh, in a completely different state of mind, a different state of knowing. And uh, the the contrast between the previous mode of perception and that mode was so striking that it uh, well, really set me thinking about what is going on in the aesthetic mode. So, I'm interested to try and understand what that difference is, what's going on. And in order to do so, I want to start off by 
uh, offering some sort of analysis of different modes of knowing. Generally speaking, we, we use two modes of knowing in the midst of our, our uh, routine lives, so to speak. The first and most obvious one is, is the mode of perceiving. Uh, we perceive a world full of objects uh, in which we stand uh, to some relationship. Um, our senses deliver us information. We assemble from that information a, a, a complex whole, which is a world. And we view that world from a, a, a single perspective, um, unity of perspective, which... Uh, all, all seems completely normal, natural, real, presents itself to us in that way. So that's the first mode of knowing, the standard mode of, of knowing, the one that most people probably would think of as real, the real world, uh, the common sense world, not in the strict sense of common sense, but the normal sense of common sense, the common sense use of common sense, uh, uh, not the real one. Uh, um, so uh, that, that's the first mode of knowing, which, which is one most people occupy all the time. And, and we take that mode of knowing to deliver us reality. We think that what we're getting through that mode of knowing is the real world occupied by a real person quite unthinkingly, quite naturally, we think like that. This is what uh, you could call the original disposition of the mind, the, 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 the way in which the, the whole organism is structured so that it knows the world without any, any effort on our part. We're just trained like that from, uh, from evolutionary ancestry and uh, our parents' interaction with us. The second mode of knowing, of course, is uh, strongly related to that. In it, it is the, the mode of knowing that is conceptualizing, where we uh, we break up the um, the overall flow of our of our of our uh, perceptual experience, our perceptual knowing, into uh, generalized uh, concepts. So, you know, I generalize people. I, I generalize audience, um, or whatever you are, auditors. Uh, I generalize um, a, a ceiling. Actually, this ceiling is completely unique. Every particle of this, this ceiling is irreproducible, and um, is, uh, it cannot really be captured by the, 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 the blunt term ceiling. But it's extremely useful if I want to get Yasho Deva to fix it. Because I say to him, go into the Dhamma Hall and fix the ceiling. Uh, and he knows what I mean. So I, I, I translate the, 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 the uh, minute particularity of my experience into um, portable concepts. Concepts that generalize, abstract from that experience and that I can then carry into the future with me and can also transport to others. I can uh, communicate to others. That's conceptualizing. It derives from uh, perceptual uh, knowing and in a, indeed, it, properly speaking, returns to uh, perceptual knowing. Uh, when I transport to Yashodeva the concept of sealing, uh, I do it in order that he can go to the, to the ceiling and do something to it. So knowing in, in the form of, uh, of conceptualizing and of course verbalizing, which is a, uh, a department, so to speak, of conceptualizing, um, it's, it's sort of second-hand experience. It's uh, a, 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 an abstraction, generalization from perceptual experience into, into the medium, so to speak, of, uh, of concepts, which I can then use to locate myself in space and time, make learn from the past, uh, make plans for the future, um, uh, give a talk at a, uh, a, a retreat that's been organised in a centre that's been built um, in a world that's threatened by an atom bomb, if you see what I mean. Um, all of that 
uh, structure of human um, human uh, I was going to say civilization sometimes it's hardly that uh, human culture uh, is is mediated by the ability to use concepts sheep are not very good at um, doing much more than chewing grass they can't um, uh, you know decide what they're going to do they can't organize things they can't learn from experience we know they lost their lamb hmm I wonder what's going to happen to the next one and so on um, they don't learn because they can't conceptualize they can't transport their experience so these are two primary modes of uh, of knowing we we know by by perceiving and we know by conceptualizing and much of the the routine of our lives and my goodness isn't all life pretty much routine uh, is uh, under the heading of uh, of uh, perceiving and uh, and conceiving but i hope that from what i've said so far we already begin to recognize the limits of perceiving and and uh, uh, thereby of conceiving um, perceiving is limited because it's uh, it's not perceiving reality it's perceiving images which are in some mysterious way related to what we might call uh, uh, reality or what a, what seems to us to be reality what we cannot but think of as reality there's a whole fascinating question there that I'm not going to go into today but uh, which is worthy of much closer inspection the relationship between the image and uh, something that appears to be a reality standing behind so to speak the image but what we perceive are images it's not reality um, it's not well, what uh, the great uh, tradition starting with Kant called the thing in itself uh, we don't perceive whatever it is that the image is an image of even though uh, even that of course is a, a conceptualized image drawn from our perceived world if you see what I mean the idea that there is something standing behind here the, uh, the metaphor uh, standing behind our experience so our perceiving is actually, uh, well, uh, again, what um, Schopenhauer called representing, what um, uh, Yogacara calls vijñapti, um, which it seems to be connected with the idea of sort of a message or an information coming to us from somewhere else. Um, and, and this is not uh, high philosophy. This is common sense. If you start to reflect upon what is going on in perceiving, it's quite straightforward to see that what you're perceiving uh, are not things, but the images that you, in effect, create. Out of what? On what basis? Well, that's another question. That's another debate, which I'm not going to have now. Insofar as conceiving is uh, uh, the generalization from perceiving, representing you might say well it must be again what Schopenhauer called representation of representation it's a, a reconstruction of a reconstruction and it's very useful very valuable it gets us all here more or less on time uh, it gets you to understand what I'm talking about and uh, it gives you useful means of discussion afterwards but uh, in the end you've got to go back to, 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 to direct experience so so much for those two forms of knowing they're very useful they're very effective especially for getting breakfast and getting into a shrine room and all that sort of thing but uh, communicating information between us arranging things and so on very very important very useful but uh, as regards uh, the fullness of, of reality, uh, strictly limited. Uh, strictly limited in the sense that, um, uh, what can I say, the solar system, the system is strictly limited. It's still a long way from the sun to the outer boundaries of the, uh, what is it, the Kuiper belt or whatever. Um, but it's limited. Uh, so, hmm, how can we go further? How can we, 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 we investigate further? 
ob obviously there's a problem immediately because we're going to be talking in terms of words and concepts. And those words and concepts we've already seen are representations of representations. So in, 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 in trying to talk about anything that any means of knowing that goes beyond or behind or underneath or around or however you like to talk about it, um, well, you're, you're constrained to use concepts that are derived from within the field of representation. So here we have to uh, recognise that uh, we've got different languages available to us. When we're uh, speaking of representation, you could say we're using the language of objects. When we're speaking the language of perception, we're speaking the language of objects. Of course, it's conceptual, but it's concepts that are immediately uh, related to perceptual experience as description. So that, that, that's the, the first level of language. It's uh, languages as descriptive uh, of perception, perceptual description. Then uh, we've got the language of, uh, of uh, abstract conceptualization, where we, we, uh, we take even a step further away from the immediacy of, uh, of d uh, perceptual description, and we discuss more and more generally. You know, there are only fine shades of difference between these two, but there's definite difference. One is, uh, if you like, first order, one is second order. So we've got, if you like, the language of uh, perceptual description and the language of uh, abstract conception. I'm, I'm using a mixture of two. You know, sometimes I'm, you know, I described my experience in the Singapore Art Gallery. Well, that's a conceptual description to some extent. Uh, sorry, a perceptual description. But then I'm starting to draw la larger themes and larger understandings from that. That's conceptual use of language, uh, use of words, use of terms. Um, both those languages uh, are, are strictly bounded by the, uh, uh, the limitations of space and time and of causality. I've, I've described a number of times over the last few days that um, we locate our, our strict experience, our, our literal experience, so to speak, within space, time and causality. We see it distributed in space as being part of a flow of time and as uh, being related to everything around it in a, in a relationship of causality. So all our perceptual language, all our conceptual language is uh, bounded by space, time and causality. So what lies beyond those Strictly speaking, we cannot talk about. And this is uh, the wonder of the Buddha, isn't it? That he, he managed to say so much whilst refusing to say what he couldn't say. Uh, what he knew saying was uh, dangerous to say. And that's the difference between Buddhism, in my humble opinion, uh, said he in a proud sort of way, uh, and uh, all other religion. Uh, uh, for instance, Hinduism which strays into vast speculations about the ultimate nature of things and their relationship to uh, the intimate relationship of things, and thereby presenting huge hostages to fortune of uh, understanding and misunderstanding. So that, uh, well, you can have a caste system whilst uh, believing in an ultimate Atman and so on, if you see what I mean. As soon as you step away into the speculative realms which try to talk about what is untalkable in talkable terms, you bugged it up. And you've led to all sorts of possibility of evil, actually. Evil. As that religion so easily lends itself to. All religion. The Buddha refused to do that. Um... And he was very well aware, it's obvious, of the, the limitations of, of those two modes of, uh, of, of talking, of two modes of speaking. But nonetheless, 
we sort of have to go a bit further. Uh, we have to go a bit further because we need to have some relationship to what does go further. Otherwise, we begin to think that we're just stuck with the world of representation, and that's it. When the, the eyes close, the night lights go out, and that's it. Um, fortunately, we have another language, a language that actually is very much alive even in the Buddha's own uh, discourse, but uh, um, not so consciously uh, referred, which is the language of images. The language of images takes us into what cannot be spoken of in terms of uh, the language of, of uh, perceptual representation and the language of conceptual uh, representation. The language of images takes us closer to the truth of things. Uh, the language of images takes us into another mode of knowing, or it uh, is the language of another mode of knowing. And that other mode of knowing, of course, is imagination. Imagination, which is, uh, I would argue, the real mode of knowing. Even our perceptual knowing is a form of imagining. I think I made that clear on the, on the second day when I spoke about the way in which our... Uh, are the, the, the images that we have in our minds, however they're uh, conditioned, uh, they are imagination. Whatever it is that con conditions them, they are imagination. <coughs> they are not something independent of us. And uh, then the, the third day, I spoke of, that was yesterday in fact, I, God, it seems to be years ago, that the, 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 the way in which we even, I am an image. Uh, when I take myself, when I begin to experience myself, especially under the, 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 the impact of uh, the aesthetic object, when I find myself uh, departing from the framework of uh, time and causality, I experience myself as an image. I don't necessarily think of it like that, but when we think about that experience, well, the best way we can think of it is as an image. Um, so all our experience ultimately is imagination all our experience is imagination even our concepts are derived from the representations which are the, uh, the work of imagination uh, imagination is our real life it's our real uh, uh, knowing it's what consciousness really means ultimately uh, and in a sense, you could say that consciousness and imagination are interchangeable terms. You can think of so many different terms that would interchange with, uh, with, with uh, imagination. Love, even, might be a, a term for imagination. But imagination has a, a unique power to help us to understand our experience. And to understand our experience, especially in the context of aesthetic moment. The aesthetic moment is where we let go of uh, the mode of, uh, of knowing that is perceiving. We've certainly let go of the mode of knowing that is conceiving. We stopped thinking. If you're thinking, the aesthetic moment is strictly limited. And that's what's so problematic about so much modern art. It requires you to, to do a lot of thinking. Uh, but... It may be that, of course, that thinking generates in you a more immediate experience. That's fine. But uh, the more your, your little brain is ticking uh, out concepts, the less aesthetic the experience is. As I say, it's the, uh, con concepts it can work the other way. They can point you towards imagination. I suppose that's poetry. Um, uh, and, and that's... Um, uh, really intelligent, uh, dumber teaching, uh, and so on, that just directs you beyond the world of representation to the world of imagination and of direct imaginative experience. So yes, when, you, when you're in the aesthetic moment, you've left behind perceiving in the narrow sense of 
interpreting your experience under the headings of space-time and causality, even, to some degree, slackening its interpretation in terms of subject and object, slackening it in terms of sub subject and object, insofar as subject and object become image, image perceiving image. Um, it's a very telling phrase from Bante's um, uh, St. Jerome Revisited, which is a, a, an extraordinary work, which I'm drawing on quite substantially in, in the background of, of everything that I'm saying. Filtered through Yogacara, Schopenhauer, Kant, and a little bit of my own uh, confusion. Um, but Bante speaks of uh, the aesthetic experience as leading you to the point at which you experience pure image and you realize that you are image perceiving image that is image perceiving image when the imagination uh, flowers or begins to flower image perceives image image imagines image uh, there is only imagining going on it doesn't mean you go into some sort of fantasy it doesn't mean that you suddenly start constructing angels flapping their wings all over the place it may do but it may be simply that everything is the same. Everything is exactly the same. But uh, you're imagining it rather than perceiving it or conceiving it. It's illumined. You're, you've separated yourself from the construction of your experience in terms of space, time and causality. You've definitely separated yourself from the abstraction of experience in terms of conceiving and you're experiencing the world as imagination uh, ringing in my mind over the last months has been that uh, uh, phrase of, um, of Blake's uh, that comes in a catalogue to some of his paintings um, uh, an exhibition of some of his um, lithographs um, name escapes me at the moment but uh, he, he talks of um, uh, he says, I look not, ha, I'm not quoting exactly, but anyway, he says something like, I look not with the eye, but through the eye. Perceiving is looking with the eye. So you, you, you take the eye's messages literally. Uh, I am here, it is there. And the eye is uh, a, a, a literal window on the world that's looking with the eye when you look through the eye you're experiencing the image uh, and you're experiencing yourself as image you're, you're experiencing yourself as liberated from the uh, uh, literalism of space time and causality at least of, of time and causality space of course still is there because there's an object there um, and as you leave behind uh, the, 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 the world of representation, the world of perceiving, and you realize it is representation, this is what Yogacara is really talking about. It's talking about recognizing that uh, our, our, our constructed world, our perceived world, is but uh, vijñati, representation, messages, images, arising in the transformations of consciousness as consciousness unfolds. Uh, so we, 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 we can directly experience what is going on right now as image. You let go of its literal straitjacket. You don't see anything different. The images on your, in, that are erected in your mind, that, that are constructed or created, in your mind, created in your mind, are no different. But you, you uh, know them. You directly experience them. Not know with your thinking brain, you know, like my words are telling you. Not like that. But you, you know directly from your immediate experience that these are representations. These are vijñapti. These are images. This is an image. And you know that you are an image. Right now, right here, in this situation, that's what's happening. These images are arising, 
causes and conditions. Causes and conditions that are unfathomable, ultimately, because you can only follow them so far. It's only useful to follow them so far. Only useful insofar as you're engaged with the world of representation and conceiving. When you let go of that world, you simply experience the creative uh, fountain of images. Images unfolding uh, like a flower. I remember Bhante uh, talking about the, 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 the mandala of the five Buddhas on, on that wonderful seminar on uh, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is a sort of foundational uh, experience for me. Um, you know, when I had quite a lot of direct pointing going on for me, just listening to Bhante, that's direct pointing. Try it sometime. Um, 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 if you just really listen to what he's saying, he's pointing to reality. And um, he talked about the, the way in which in the, in the, in the Bardo state, the, um, uh, the, the, the five Buddha mandala sort of efflorescence. So first of all, you get each Buddha figure of emerging one after the other, day by day, in a rather Procrustean sort of way. Uh, but you can take that as an image uh, rather than so literal, you know, this day that, this day that. It's an image for something that uh, is beyond all such temporal constructions. And uh, what then happens is they begin to riot. Uh, the Buddhas begin to explode. It's first of all, the Buddha explodes into five Buddhas. Then each of the Buddhas explodes into multiple Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And then they explode into all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, uh, figures, um, Paisachis and Gauris and uh, all sorts of things. Uh, the, the, the imagination efflorescences. And uh, Abante spoke at the time of um, this representing or, or being an image uh, for enlightenment itself. Otherwise you think of enlightenment as sort of coming to an end. And in a certain sense, it is a coming to an end. It's a coming to an end of the, the, uh, the clinging to representations as literally applying to uh, uh, me and things. It's a coming to the end of, of concepts as actually describing reality. It's a coming to the end of all that. But in, in, in imaginative terms, it's not the coming to end of anything. It's the beginning of everything. So, uh, imagination, when we, when we really allow ourselves to uh, experience imagination free from, increasingly free from, the, the, the boundaries of, of representation, the boundaries of perceptual representation, the boundaries of conceiving, the more and more we let go of that, the more and more we experience ourselves as image, imagining image and we experience that image as imagining image as uh, a an inexhaustible fountain of creative uh, energy if you want to call it anything you become so aware when you start to talk in this field that language is so banal so flat so dull uh, and so inexact and necessarily pushes you back down exactly where you're trying to get away from uh, if only one had the voice of a, of a prophet or a poet or uh, one in ecstasy or something like that. But one has only flat, prosaic words to describe what is the exact opposite. But that's what art does for us. Art in combination with uh, everything else that uh, we do in our spiritual lives, in our Dhamma lives. Uh, it, it enables us to enter the world of imagination. It protects us from all the falsities of imagination or the fal false trails of imagination because, as I've already indicated, <coughs> imagination can so easily turn merely to uh, egoistic fantasy, uh, self-delusion. It can turn to madness. Uh, but madness is really the, the, the confusion of the literal with the imaginative. Uh, it's when you cannot distinguish properly between the, 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 the imaginative realm and, uh, and the literal realm. Um, and that's what superstition is, isn't it, in religion? It's where you, 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 um, you, you cannot understand a metaphor. 
you can only see the metaphor literally. You know, if you say, my love is like a red, red rose, you, you're looking for her thorns. Um, <laughs> <get it. laughs> um, so, so imagination does need safeguards. And uh, just a little plug, right at the end of my paper on, uh, on uh, reimagining the Buddha, I, I've written something I think is one of the most important things that I've done in those papers, which is five safeguards of imagination, which I think it's quite important to visit. And uh, I think if you're examining this area, you need to, to recognize this. Otherwise, what you seem to be doing is uh, advocating madness and fantasy. Uh, I've, I've even experienced this in talking about the field of imagination. I've realized that one or two of my auditors are... Um, um, you know, justifying their own delusions. So, without the safeguards to imagination, without a real recognition of the of the nature of uh, of perceiving, and a real recognition of what con conceiving means, imagining is delusion, fantasy, uh, self infatuation, um, and, and uh, worse, it's evil. It's really important to, to make sure that when we exercise imagination, we do it with all those safeguards. So, uh, art can lead us deep into the imagination. I believe the greatest of artists uh, touch those depths. And they, uh, they do lead us to the, to the, the gateways of, uh, of, of reality itself, you might say. Yatha Bhutta... Uh, they lead us to things as they really are. They show us uh, imagination as the life of everything. Imagination as the force that uh, uh, generates all our experience in accordance with the principles of conditionality when viewed under the heading of space-time and causality. And uh, without art, I think we very easily... Uh, become absorbed in technique and conception. And our realizations are merely conceptualizations, clever, deep, penetrating, even important conceptualizations. But they lack the, uh, the power, the breadth, the depth, the ineffability of imagination that sweeps us into dimensions where we are just image and, and what we're perceiving, what we're imagining is just image. Indeed, I've come to think that uh, the way in which one would apply the, the, the idea of no self here is not in terms of recognising that there is no image that is you, but is recognising that you are an image. You are an image and, well, you could say, and no more. But that makes it seem like being an image is not very much. But that you are an image. Uh, and that that image is no different from the image that the image knows. That it's no different from the imagination itself. That image, imagining image, is reality itself. Further than that, of course, I can't go. And even in what I've said so far... I've given so many hostages to fortune that uh, I probably should shut up while the going is good. Uh, but I hope that I've given you some flavour of, of the depths to which uh, even our aesthetic moment can take us and in which uh, the greatest aesthetic guides that humanity has uh, produced so far, created so far, uh, are, can take us a deep, deep indeed. I began by talking about uh, Bante's reference to Wordsworth's lines written uh, above Tintern Abbey. And uh, it's very striking that Bante considered that um, those words took us to the same depths, or to, at least to the threshold of the same depths as uh, the Dhamma takes us to. He's not going to be so foolish as to pronounce on, on where exactly Wordsworth is in the scale of things. As we know, scales are ridiculous. They just come from the world of space and time. 
what a joke. Um, but um, they take us, uh, th 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 somebody like Wordsworth takes us very deep indeed. And you remember Bante's resolution of his problem of Buddhism and art, uh, the Dhamma or art, Sangharakshita 1 and Sangharakshita 2. It came in that moment when he was uh, 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 teaching a, a bunch of Indian uh, um, uh, school children, school boys, uh, Shelley's The Cloud. Interestingly enough, um, the, the, the daughter of, a, of a, uh, a couple of order member friends of ours in India, um, Kamala Shri and Kumar Ajeev, his, uh, their daughter uh, uh, Sayuri, had been studying the cloud at, at school. And uh, she said she got into a lot of trouble because she refused to answer the questions the, the teacher was uh, asking them. You know, what does the cloud mean? She just wouldn't have it. Uh, she knew there was more to it than the cloud is blah, blah, blah. Uh, and uh, so she asked me to go through with it with her, the uh, a 12 year old girl. So we went through it. With both our minds were blown away. Um, but I could see exactly what Matt Bante meant. He said that when he was teaching the students the cloud, not in the way they were supposed to learn it, but by really penetrating deeply into the poem, that uh, he found that without trying to, without meaning to, he was talking the Dhamma. Without changing his language, without... Uh, moving from one to the other, not consciously doing so, he found that he was speaking in the same depths as he would be if he was speaking the Dhamma. Now let's not get all literal about this and decide what, where, whether Schopenhauer, I mean, what's his name, Shelley was a stream entrant or not. But um, what, what you get to the point that when we start to uh, engage with, with art at its, at its depths, and the greatest of art, and I'm afraid there is greater and lesser art. We'll argue about that another time if you want to. Uh, but uh, the greatest of art touches those depths because the artists themselves have touched those depths. And they've, the skill, the, 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 uh, the craft to communicate their insight and understanding in the, the sensuous medium that is before them. Um, in Shakespeare, in creating a Hamlet, has not merely created a, 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 a wonderful, dramatic piece that is engaging. One thing I find really interesting about Hamlet, you can never see the same Hamlet twice. Uh, every performer of Hamlet interprets it differently because there's something about the, the creation of Hamlet that evades final description, evades final analysis. He's touched on the depth of humanity, on the depth of what it is to be alive, what it is to know. So the greatest of the artists, uh, and some of, uh, some of them are very great indeed, and maybe many have glimpses and are able to communicate something, they take us right into the heart of reality, because they, they, they show us uh, our, own ex our own imaginations, they show us imagination itself, not our imagination, but imagination itself, because it's beyond the boundaries of space and time, and therefore beyond the boundaries of uh, number, I and thine, one and two. There's just imagination, and we are image imagining image.